Hello everyone, Merry Christmas Eve, and thank you for joining us on this very special day as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In just a minute, we're going to join with our worship team in singing two uh, traditional Christmas hymns, and then we have two very exceptional young ladies who are going to perform a Christmas song for us, and then I'm going to be back and read to you from Luke chapter 2 and share some final thoughts as we prepare to celebrate Christmas. But before all of that, would you join me and would you sing as we celebrate Jesus as the reason for this Christmas season. So let's worship together.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining me in singing those traditional Christmas hymns and for that wonderful uh, Christmas presentation. Boy, there's just something that's so special about Christmas music that just brings so much joy. And so I'm glad that we get to share that together. But would you join me? I want to read to you from Luke chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 7. And it says this, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own hometown. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So we just read that in the days before Mary would give birth to her firstborn son, that a decree is issued from Caesar Augustus. This decree was a spontaneous order that required everyone under Roman rule to follow and obey. This unexpected decree could not have happened at a worse time for Mary and Joseph. Mary is pregnant and are ready to give birth and is in no condition to travel. The travel from Galilee, where they were, to Bethlehem would be around a seven to ten day journey to complete. But you know what? God never wastes an unexpected moment in our lives. He's never surprised and he's never caught off guard, but he works out all things for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Yet this untimely decree was the motivating factor that Mary and Joseph needed in order to fulfill an 800-year-old prophecy found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. That prophecy states that the birth of the Messiah 
would take place in Bethlehem. See, it seems highly unlikely that Mary would choose to go on a 90-mile hike uphill at this stage of her pregnancy. Yet what seems like an inconvenient moment demonstrates how God's sovereignty is at work and is not hampered or hindered by empires or rulers. You know, you may be facing circumstances right now that feel more like a setback than anything else. But if we're surrendered to the will of God, God will work through those circumstances to produce something in your life that would not have happened without him. And so Mary accompanies Joseph to Bethlehem, although technically there was no real legal reason for her to do so. Mary accompanies Joseph on the trip to Bethlehem, although there was no technical or legal reason for her to do so. But one reason why she may have chose to go with him was because at this stage of the pregnancy, there was no way she could conceal that truth. Anyone with the basic math skills would understand that Mary had become pregnant during the engagement period, and she would have been looked upon with contempt. Joseph would have agreed to take Mary with him in order to prevent her from dealing with such harsh treatment from people alone. As they complete their journey and arrive in Bethlehem, they find that there is no place for them to stay. You got to understand that the city would be at capacity as everybody who had moved away from Bethlehem now has to return to Bethlehem in order to be registered. The irony of this is that Joseph is returning to his hometown. And you would think there might be some family or extended family or even friends who would welcome them in and have compassion on them. It appears from our story that people in Bethlehem also did the math and understood that Mary had become pregnant outside of marriage. And in an honor-shame culture, no one was willing to take them in in order to bring dishonor into their home. But Joseph and Mary had to expect this sort of greeting and treatment, although I'm sure they were hoping that they would find someone who would have compassion on them considering Mary's current situation. When choosing this couple, God had to know that they would be the object of ridicule and shame as people would fail to understand or even believe their story. But Mary and Joseph accepted this reality in exchange for honor and obedience. You know, Matthew chapter 5 verse 10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, after they find no room or no friend or no family to tank them in, they settle for a room at a local Airbnb. Now this was no five-star rated stay but it was shelter from the elements, even if they were next to a stable where the resident family kept their livestock. Now Christmas tradition puts Mary and Joseph in a barn alongside of animals based on certain English translations, but more realistically, in Bethlehem at this time, they would have more likely have been, uh, have been dwelling inside of a cave. As you can see from these pictures, there is a room to the side of an open area by the steps where cattle may have slept, and there's an open area where the living space and maybe eating would take in place. And this is more likely what Mary and Joseph ended up with at their stay in Bethlehem. You know, when you look at it, you can't help but think what a humble accommodation for a king. What an introduction of the Savior to the world he found in Bethlehem. A small room next to a stable does not seem fitting for a king, but maybe this is exactly what God had intended. You know, it says this in Philippians chapter 2, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, Jesus was not born in a palace behind guarded walls. He was not born to royalty and out of reach to the common person. He was born in a home of an unknown person in a very visible location 
which permitted the visit by a group of outcast shepherds. And today, as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, we celebrate how God sent his one and only son so that you and I can have a relationship with him. He removed every barrier that might prevent us from knowing him. What God demonstrated on Christmas Day is that he's accessible to everyone. You can approach him and he is never out of reach. You know, this child that we celebrate on Christmas Day became a man. And as we celebrate on Easter, he would become the perfect sacrifice for your sin and my sin so that we could be forgiven once and for all. See, he provides you and I with a new life and then with eternal life when this life is over. And as we get ready to open up gifts on Christmas morning, remember this, that God gave you his greatest gift in his one and only son. You know, it was 30 years ago on Christmas when as a high school student, I was attending a church, I was asked to help participate in our Christmas play. They asked if I would operate one of the spotlights for the performance. And you know, song after song and performance after performance, I stood there and I watched and I heard the songs and I watched the actors and through that presentation, I learned how much God loved me and how much I meant to him. You know, it was during that final performance on that Sunday right before Christmas, as the pastor comes forward at the end of the presentation and he makes a offer to those who are watching that if anyone wanted to receive God's gift of forgiveness, that he would make their life brand new by clearing their slate and giving them a new life. And as I was operating that uh, spotlight and they asked you to raise your hand, my hand went up, which I doubt he could see. And as he led those who came forward in prayer, I recited that prayer. And I tell you what, in that moment, my life was completely different. As a 15-year-old boy, I was carrying such guilt and shame and bitterness in my life, but God took all of that away and gave me the gift of eternal life. And today, just like I received 30 years ago, that opportunity to invite God into my life and receive his gift of forgiveness, I want to extend that offer to you today. I'm going to put some words up on the screen, and if you would recite those with me and mean it from your heart, I'll tell you this, that God will make all things new in your life. He will clear the slate. All your guilt and shame from the past will be erased, and you'll have a new life in that very moment in Christ. So just repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, I'm sorry for my sin. I've made a mess of my life. I believe Jesus Christ is your son and that he died for my sins, and you raised him to life. I want to invite him into my life and give him control of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, friend, if you recited that prayer, the Bible says that you're a new creation. Every sin you've ever committed has been completely exonerated from your record, and you are a new creature today in Christ. Well, as you celebrate this Christmas, remember the gift that God gave to us, the greatest gift. It's not going to be found under a tree this year, but it was found in an unknown home of a, a person in Bethlehem as God's gift of love for you and me. Well, as you celebrate Christmas this Christmas season, I pray that the joy and peace of that very first Christmas would be yours as you celebrate Jesus as the reason for this season. God bless you and Merry Christmas. Thank you.